All right, class. Baroque art is a period of artistic style that is used that used exaggerated motion and clear, easily interpreted detail to produce drama, tension, exuberance, and grandeur in sculpture, painting, architecture, literature, dance, and music. The style began in the 1600s in Rome, Italy, and spread to most of Europe. The popularity and success of the Baroque style was encouraged by the Roman Catholic Church which had decided at the time of the Council of Trent, in response to the Protestant Reformation, that the arts should communicate religious themes in direct and emotional involvement. The aristocracy also saw this dramatic style of the Baroque architecture and art as a means of impressing visitors and expressing triumph, power, and control. Baroque palaces are built around an entrance of courts, grand staircases, and reception rooms of sequentially increasing opulence. All right, Caravaggio's The Supper at Emmaus. The Supper at Emmaus, a popular theme in Christian art, represents the story told in St. Luke's Gospel when after the crucifixion, two of Christ's apostles invite an apparent stranger whom they've just met to share a meal with them. When he blesses and breaks the bread, they realize that their guest is, in fact, the resurrected Christ. Ah. St. Luke names one of the apostles as Cleophius, but he does not identify the other. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Behind them, the innkeeper gapes uncomprehendingly. Cavergio has chosen to represent one precise moment, namely that fraction of a second after the two apostles have realized that they are witnessing a miracle of unimaginable power. He freezes that moment, renders it permanent, and enables us to take our time to consider the miracle and to experience for ourselves the sense of shock and astonishment that was felt by the two apostles. It is not certain for whom the artist painted the Supper of Emmaus, but we do know that it was made in Rome probably around 1602 at the height of the Counter-Reformation. The Council of Trent, established to combat the continued threat of Protestantism, has declared in 1563 that by means of the stories of the mysteries of the redemption portrayed by the painting or other representation, the people are instructed and confirmed in the habit of remembering and continually revolving in mind of articles and faith. So this is a Baroque style painting that was um, definitely uh, meant to uh, embolden the church, the Catholic church, and make it stronger. Let's take a look at Rubens' painting, Marie de' Medici. Um, this painting was commissioned by Marie de' Medici in which Rubens was to promote her divine right to reign as Queen of France. Between 1622 and 26, Rubens painted 21 enormous pictures that cleverly combine historical fact and allegorical fiction in flattering depictions of the uh, events of Marie's life. Uh, Marie is depicted in idealized glory at the exact moment of her arrival in France after her voyage from Italy on November 3rd, 1600. All eyes focus on her as she disembarks, flanked by her ladies-in-waiting. Uh, so, of course, that's her right here in the middle. As Henry was not there to meet her, she is welcomed by the allegorical personification in France, who is decorated with a cape. The actual voyage had been rough, and fortune holds the rudder of the tiny ship bearing the Medici coat of arms. Neptune and Nerides, the daughters of the sea god Nerus, salute the beautiful young woman down below. So these are you know, some of the daughters of the gods of the sea. And above flies flame, triumphing the arrival of um, Marie de' Medici. Um, <clears throat> this painting depicts the scene of, you know, that from the life of Marie de Medici as a member of the powerful Florentine Medici family. Marie brought a generous dowry and important connections to her marriage with King Henry IV, the first of the Bourbon kings of France. The two were married in 1600, but Henry was assassinated ten years later, just one day after her coronation. Due to French Salic law, which forbade succession through the female line, Marie was unable to rule in her own right as Queen of France. Um, but she did rule through her son as a regent until he had her banished in 1617 and then once again in 1630. This is a great example of Baroque art. All right, let's look at Velasquez's The Maids of Honor. 
Uh, Velasquez's most celebrated and ambitious work is an excellent example of his distinct style, which combined elements of international Baroque and Spanish naturalism. Scholars still disagree about what exactly is taking place in this complex scene, simultaneously a self-portrait, a group portrait, a royal portrait, and a genre scene. This image represents an imagined moment from the artist's life in which he is working in the studio of, of the palace. In the central foreground stands the young Infantado Margarita, accompanied by her two maids-in-waiting, her favorite dwarfs, and a large dog. Behind this, um, so we've got uh, quite a few different things going on here. We've got the um, Infantada right here, Margarita, with her um, favorite maids and, you know, the big old dog. Behind is a lady that is uh, in mourning, and she has the attire of someone who has just come from a funeral or getting ready to go. In the back, we have someone that's leaving the door. The door is open, some symbolism there. Um, and then over here, we have a self-portrait, Velasquez, actually painting um, himself in this painting. But what's uh, quite peculiar is that all the way in the back is a mirror that is actually showing what uh, Velasquez is painting on this canvas. Um, so um, people are lead, led to believe that it, that is the king and queen of France and that Velasquez is painting them on this canvas and all of these people are just there to keep them company. Baroque art. All right, Sir uh, Anthony Van Dyke painted Charles I at the hunt. The subject of this work is Charles I of England pictured on one of his countryside hunts. Charles was an avid art fan, and during his reign, he asked various artists, especially those promoting the Counter-Reformation, to come and carry out work for him. His love of the art was actually the reason he accumulated various debts. Anthony Van Dyck was Charles' favorite painter and settled at his court after 1630. Uh, it was only a short time later, in 1649, that Charles was convicted of treason, and he was actually beheaded. Um, this picture... And the overall color uh, palette of this painting is dark, and the artist only uses dashes of bold and bright color to lighten certain areas of the canvas, namely surrounding those of the king. The flesh tones in this piece vary, but Van Dyke uses a strong amount of reds for flushed faces of the stable boys in the background. This was done only to accentuate the king's presence, as Charles' skin tone is light and has softly blended red hues to express his good health. The most striking color in this canvas um, is the use of Van Dyke's uh, bold red for the king's trousers, which take on a velvety texture. Van Dyke paints the red thickly and lavishly to accentuate the fabric. He uses pure black to define the folds and shadows for the hev heavy material and also uses a yellow to show the softness and the richness of the material. Van Dyke uses many browns, soft pastels, are used for the king's riding boots, sash, and gloves, and the same mix is used for the horse's mane. Uh, the signature Van Dyke uh, brown is used for the stable hand looking after the horse standing in the shadow. All right, Peter de Hoosh worked in the small and relatively quiet city of Delft from 1652 to about 1660. Like other Delft artists, most notably uh, Vermeer, um, Peter de Hoosh painted everyday scenes that are remarkable for their clarity of perspective and harmony of light. He gave order to his compositions by emphasizing the geometry of architectural elements. The positioning of doors, windows, and their shutters, floor tiles, and bricks was all carefully calculated and painted. Women going about their daily chores or attending to visitors, such as the soldiers seen here sitting around at the table smoking and drinking, are a frequent theme of de Hooch's work. Um, so, of course, this is called uh, the interior of a Dutch courtyard. The man wearing the breastplate is setting down the pitcher he has used to refill the pass glass held by the woman. The pass glass was used in drinking games. Each participant had to drink down a circular line on the glass, failing to reach the exact level. The revealer would be required to drink down to the next ring. Only when this was done successfully would the glass be passed on to the next participant. The little girl carries a brazier of hot coals so that the two soldiers can light their long-stemmed white clay pipes. Despite the apparent realism and the presence of the tower in 
uh, the background, the scene probably does not depict any uh, specific courtyard. This is a perfect example of uh, Northern European Baroque art. Now let's take a look at Vermeer's The Lace Maker. Uh, the work shows a young woman in a room dressed in a yellow shawl bent as she sews and threads a dress. As you can see, the pale and empty wall in the background intensifies the quality of the young lace mayor and drives our attention to uh, physical activity. Regarding the lady, critics have often said that the lace maker could be a member of his family. Um, taking into account the date of the painting and the corresponding ages of his eldest daughter, it is easy to know that the lace maker is perhaps one of them. At first sight, what attracts our attentions are her eyes, which are looking down. This fact shows the great concentration of uh, her work. Uh, after looking at um, her, we realize that her eyes encourage the viewer to pass on to a more defined middle ground. Here is where the activity takes place. Although we cannot see the kind of lace she is making, we can draw some conclusions from her tools, which Vermeer has drawn with sufficient precision. The girl rests her hands on light blue lace making pillows. It was used to make shorter pieces or uh, stripes of lace, which seemed to be the case for Vermeer's work. Pricking card is partly visible, fixed on a blue pillow. Little holes are pricked into this card to establish the desired pattern. Pins are inserted carefully into ev every hole around which the thread was intertwined. Around these pins, the threads furnished by the bobby pins and interwoven and cross crossed according to the pattern. A part form that it's obvious that there is a light from the outside even if there is no window in the painting because it illuminates her hands as well as her face. Uh, and this is a, a excellent example of Baroque art. All right, let's take a look at Rembrandt, the anatomy lesson. Uh, Rembrandt uh, was one of the most talented Dutch painters of his time and the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tolp is an example of his remarkably innovative style. Born in Leiden, Rembrandt moved to Amsterdam, 1631. There his career thrived and his portraits in particular were in high demand from the city's elite who had grown, grown uh, wealthy through the extensive trading and colonization. Here he records the dissection by the noted physician, Dr. Tolp, with various members of the Surgeon's Guild observing. In the 17th century, dissections were a form of public entertainment, but only the body of a criminal could be dismembered. Dr. Tolp works from the corpse of a man who had been executed the day before for stealing a coat. Some scholars believe that this painting was commissioned in order to promote the merit of Amsterdam doctors. To demonstrate his proficiency, Dr. Tolp is depicted exposing the tendons that moved the thumb and the forefinger because the arm was to believe to be the most difficult to depict. Uh, this painting, was, which was produced at the beginning of Rembrandt's career, reveals his ability to depart from the artistic convention and produce works that are anima animated and naturalistic, whereas most contemporary group portraits portray the figures in a horizontal line spread evenly across the can canvas. Rembrandt grouped the observers in a pyramidal form on the left side. Each of the figures paid to be included in this painting was meant to glorify each as a learned and distinguished member of the middle class society. They are all given individual attention with a unique pose and facial expression, and each of the heads is on a different level, thus giving the sense of spontaneity. So, you know, we can see the pyramidal effect right here by the observers. Um, you can see the uh, dissection down here of the arm, um, and they actually have a book over here that he is referencing. All right, let's look at Poussin, the death of <clears throat> Germanicus. The young Roman general Germanicus has just been poisoned by his jealous adoptive father, the emperor Tiberius. On his deathbed, Germanicus asks his friends to avenge his murder and his wife to endure her sorrow bravely. The subject of this, Poussin's first major histor history painting, comes from the annals of the Roman historian Tactius. The events occurred 19, uh, in the year 19, a key work in Western painting, 
this tragic picture presents a moral lesson in Stoic heroism, seen especially in the restraint and dignity of mourning soldiers. This painting became the model for countless deathbed scenes for two centuries to come, particularly for neoclassical art around the 1800s. Many powerful human themes figure here, death, suffering, injustice, grief, loyalty, and revenge. Poussin drew on Roman antiquity for the form as well as the subject of this painting. The composition with its shallow spatial arrangement is based on a Roman sarcophagus relief. Poussin spent most of his life in Rome where he created classical style that strongly influenced both French and Italian art.